Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is the granddaughter of one of the most beloved couples in the history of show business, the king and queen of Westerns, Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. They co-starred in 88 movies. They had a radio show for nine years, and starting in the 50s, they were on TV almost continuously, starting with the Roy Rogers show, the Roy Rogers and Dale Evans show, Happy Trails Theatre, and they appeared in dozens of variety and talk shows and award shows throughout their lives. They recorded over 400 songs and sold millions of records. Roy Rogers was the number one Western box office star for 11 years in a row, from 1943 to 1954. He has four stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame for his contribution to TV, radio, music and the movies and he's the only performer to have been inducted twice into the country music hall of fame once as part of the sons of the pioneers and the second time as an individual performer he was so incredibly popular back in the 50s and 60s that there were over 400 toys and merchandising items with roy rogers name on them and there was even a chain of Roy Rogers restaurants. And Dale Evans was an immensely successful star in her own right. She wrote their iconic theme song, Happy Trails, which was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame in 2008 and was named one of the top 100 Western songs of all time by the Western Writers of America. And get this, Dale Evans also wrote the classic Sunday school song, The Bible Tells Me So. She also wrote 29 books, including her mega bestseller, Angel Unaware, inspired by their child, Robin, who was born with Down syndrome and who died two days before her second birthday. Dale Evans has two stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame for her work in movies and on television. Although we knew Roy Rogers and Dale Evans as the king and queen of the Westerns, our guest knew them as simply grandma and grandpa. She's just released a wonderful, heartwarming book entitled Your Heroes, My Grandparents, A Granddaughter's Love. The book gives us an intimate look at who Roy Rogers and Dale Evans really were, not only as superstars, but especially as devoted partners, parents of nine children, and grandparents of 16 children. Our guest is an elementary school teacher who spent the last 20 years traveling across the country to Western festivals, fairs, and rodeos to sing, tell stories, sit on panels, ride in parades, and meet with fans to honor and celebrate the legacy of her beloved grandparents and keep their memory alive. She and her two sisters sang and performed around the country in a group called The Rogers Legacy, and she co-hosted a popular radio show called Around the Barn. And she and her husband, Gino, run the Gino Pamelia Baseball Camp every summer in Larkspur, California. And for many years, she's ridden horseback on the Pasadena Rose Parade on New Year's Day. I'm delighted to welcome Julie Rogers Pomelia to our show. Julie, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here this morning. Julie, I really loved your book because you confirmed for me that the private Roy Rogers and Dale Evans were very much the same as their public image. They were all about their love of family, their country, and their faith in God, right? They were absolutely that, yes. You've described them as ordinary people who lived extraordinary lives. What did you mean by that? Well, they did not treat themselves as if they were entitled they didn't treat us that that like we should feel entitled. And they were just ordinary people that had very extraordinary experiences and, and a life and a job beyond their home life. And it was really an extension of themselves. They were so authentic. A lot of people today may not realize the extent of Roy Rogers' popularity, not only as an entertainer, but as a positive role model. In the 1940s, Life Magazine conducted a poll for children and posed the question, who would you most want to be like? The result was a three-way tie between President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, and Roy Rogers. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it kind of is. Very Three very different walks of life and very important people. Can you take us back to the moment, Julie, when you first realized that your grandparents were famous? 
Well, when I was very young, I just thought that everybody's grandfather had a TV show. And I thought that was everybody's normal. And, you know, normal is whatever you grow up with. So I thought that was everybody's normal. But when I was in second grade, he ended up on the cover of our Scholastic News Weekly Reader. And my teacher just had a, a an amazing reaction. She just, I couldn't understand why she was so excited. And she talked to the class about it. And I was a little embarrassed. I didn't know why the big deal was being made. And when I went home that day, I asked my parents a, a lot of questions as to, you know, are they different? Are we different? Why did they make such a big deal about this? Doesn't everybody's grandparents do this? And come to find out, no, they didn't. And so that was my small beginning of realizing the effect they had on other people. So as you were growing up and people knew that you were the granddaughter of these superstars, did you find any challenges in your own youth, in your relationships with other people, your friends, your teachers? Well, when I got into about fifth or sixth grade, some of the girls, and I've taught fifth and sixth grade, and they they can, you know, girls are interesting at that age. They can be a, a little, there can be a little jealousy, a little kind of pecking order, things like that. And before meeting me, some girls would assume that I was conceited or I just thought more of myself or whatever. I thought I was big stuff. And that hurt my feelings a lot because that's not how I felt. And so I had a little bit of that, a little bit of talking and gossiping and stuff like that. And the boys would just tease me. And I didn't know back then that sometimes teasing with boys meant that they might have liked you a little bit. <laughs> so for a while, I kept it very quiet and very low key. I never mentioned my family at all. But other than that, the older I get, the more appreciative I get of my grandparents and the more I, I really love to talk about them. Well, you and the family appeared on two Christmas specials with Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. The first was with Dinah Shore and the second was with Jonathan Winters. Do you have any memories of being in those shows that you can share with us? Well, I don't have any memories of the Dinah Shore show, but I do have a picture of me sitting on the couch next to grandma on the set. And I look like, like I'm just about ready to pick my nose or something embarrassing. But I was, I was what, two? <laughs> on Jonathan Winters, my cousin kind of added a little bit of embarrassment to that show because he chose to kind of go rogue, say, in the middle of the show. And he ended up throwing a rubber ball at Jonathan Winters on stage as he was telling us a story and knocked his Viking hat off. And Jonathan Winters just went off uh, off script and he was funnier than the script was. And he had even the cameraman, I, you know, their their tears were rolling down their face. We didn't know what to do. It was a very interesting show, but I do remember that very well. I was 10. Well, I remember seeing that and being really impressed that Jonathan Winters must have been the one to tell the directors and the producers to keep that in the show. Yeah, <laughs> it was pretty funny. It was pretty funny. And he probably did. In my book, I explain what he said to grandma 15 years later when he saw grandma. So I won't spoil it, but it's very clear that he never really did let my cousin Rob get off the hook on that one. <laughs> yes, I remember that. That alone is worth the price of the book. Now, when you got married, Julie, your grandparents sang a personalized version of Happy Trails and your grandma sang a song she wrote for you called Julie. Did someone record those performances so you can still watch them? You know, when we got married, it was just before the age of videotaping a wedding. And it was only audio. And I'm sure I have the audio somewhere in that black hole I call my garage. And just recently, since I've written this book, I've been very interested in finding all of those things. So I'll let you know when I find it, but it's only audio, but it was very, very special. Oh, I can so imagine. I actually got goosebumps when I read that part of your book because no one 
that I know of has ever had such an unforgettable moment at their own wedding. Yes, it, it was. And it was a surprise. I didn't know they were going to do that. So I got a bit teary and it was pretty it was pretty cool. I think the funny thing for me with the song she called Julie was that she scribbled it on the back of a a call sheet from the Barbara Mandrell show. And that was so typical grandma. She would write on the backs of envelopes, napkins, receipts, anything she could find and stuff it in her purse. You never knew what you were going to find in there, but you didn't look, you didn't dare look. <laughs> you spent a lot of time with your grandparents when you were growing up and you were very close to them. You had your grandpa Roy in your life till you were 40 years old and you had your grandma Dale in your life till you were 43. So you knew them really well. So my question to you is, what would you say was the most important thing you learned from them? Oh, I, by far, I learned how important authenticity is and to stay true to your values and not let, whether it be Hollywood or any other thing in your life, uh, in, you know, in, envelop you and make you forget and lose your sense of, what's right, what's wrong, your sense of where you came from and your sense of self. They were, they were so very uh, true to who they said they were. They didn't have to tell me how to act or live. They showed me by their lives. Do you get, I mean, now looking back and being the age you are, do you get how unbelievably remarkable that is that in an industry that is completely drowning in inauthenticity and insincerity, that these people who were in the business so long were able to convey that to you? Yes. And it takes, I think, a few years for most people to kind of come into a better knowledge of who they are and who their family was. Because like I said, I didn't really appreciate it growing up. I just lived it. And then little by little along the way, I started appreciating it more and more. And it is pretty amazing because they didn't falter at all. They were blackballed for it uh, for a time with one of the networks. And that was okay because they were living their truth and they weren't going to deviate from, you know, being authentic. Well, I think that makes them so remarkable. Can I tell you what the lessons are that I learned from reading your book? Because you gave us the chance to know them through you. I yeah. can tell you that the, the lessons that I felt came through from you was not to take yourself too seriously and always have a sense of humor. Yes. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Especially with grandma. She and I were so much alike. And she'd say, oh, baby, you're so much like me. And I think, I don't know if that's a compliment or not, <laughs> but I'll take it. Don't take yourself so seriously because, you know, you've got to be able to laugh at yourself because inevitably, if you're in front of people, sometime you're going to end up doing something or saying something that is embarrassing. And we're just all human and that's the humanity of it. You just got to laugh. And they really, they really had a lot of laughter in their household. And I loved it because it was, it was a very fun place to be. You know, you mentioned that your grandmother told you that you were the one in the family who most resembled her. You were also told that by other people in the family what is it in your personality, do you think, that most resembles Dale Evans? Well, hmm, I think it's just because I pretty much say what I feel. And sometimes I don't think before I talk. I'm not sure that's a good thing to admit. But you know what? I'm pretty honest. And that's that's a lot like grandma. She was very honest. And we're just who we are. And... I think that part of her just kind of got passed down to me. I may not be the one that looks like her as much, but my personality is definitely her. I just, I talk very easily. That's a nice way of saying I talk a lot. And I love to meet people. I love to have conversation with new people and old people and everybody in between. And that's, that's what I gained from her. 
I think you have a natural comfort with people and with expressing yourself. And I think that's a fabulous quality to inherit from a grandparent or a parent. Well, thank you very much. It's taken me a while to embrace that, but thank you. Now, as you know, Julie, your aunt Cheryl Rogers Barnett wrote a book about her parents called Cowboy Princess, Life with My Parents, Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. What did you think of the book? I loved it. I loved it. And she has a whole different perspective being their daughter. And my Uncle Dusty wrote a book too, Growing Up with Roy and Dale. And he has a whole different perspective being their son. And I just, I love both of their books. They're very true to what happened. They were, they were honest and beautiful. And I love, I love rereading those books over and over again. I don't get tired of it. I love them. Yeah, I did too. There's so much about your grandparents to admire and respect. For example, a lot of people may not know that your grandparents were the first celebrities to bring much needed awareness and understanding and fundraising for children with special needs, weren't they? Yes, they were. And I think a lot of that was due to the fact they had a special needs child themselves. Actually, two of my aunts and uncles were special needs. My uncle Sandy, on a much lower level, had some mild brain damage and a broken nose and some issues, emotional issues from being abused when he was little. So they got him, adopted him from an abused child's home, a uh, children's home. And then Robin, the one, the only daughter that they had together between the two of them biologically was born with Down syndrome and very serious heart defects. And she only lived to be just, just before her second birthday. And they were not uh, shying away at all at the time talking about her. And, you know, the doctor said, well, where are you going to put her? <laughs> Assuming that they were going to institutionalize her because back then that's what they did. And they said, what do you mean? We're going to take her home. And so they were very instrumental in raising awareness that these children are special, are very, very precious and almost like angels in your life. And thus the book Angel Unaware that she wrote. And they changed, she changed their family, our family for the positive forever. After that, they, there was much more love and acceptance and she just was pivotal in our family. And before then people were embarrassed to talk about those kids. And I think they really brought it out that no, what's embarrassing about it? And they started seeing lots of families with those children that had needs, all different kinds of needs, coming out to their rodeos. And so grandpa insisted with those event planners that the first few rows were going to be saved for those families. And afterwards, they would stay on their horses and side pass along the railing and meet. They wouldn't stop until they met and talked with every single family. So it was very much in their hearts. It sure was. Your, and I should mention that your grandparents raised a lot of money for children's charities and they created the Happy Trails Children's Foundation. Mm -hmm. There's so much to be proud of as their granddaughter. Now, your grandparents suffered really unimaginable tragedy. They lost three children. Robin, who died just before her second birthday. Debbie, who died at the age of 12 in a car accident and John, better known as Sandy, who died suddenly at the age of 18 in Germany. You wrote that your grandparents handled these terrible tragedies with great courage and grace. And these losses did not destroy or even diminish their faith in God, which is really quite remarkable, I think. Tell me about their faith and how it sustained them. Well, those kinds of tragedies really do either they do polarizing things to families. They either draw them closer together or they tear them apart. And in my grandparents' lives, it drew them together and it drew them closer to God because that, you know, their faith in God was the only thing that was unshakable because it, as it was shown in the events in their life, life changes in a, in a split second and you can't really count on anything but but God and they were not ashamed to talk about that they didn't shove it down your throats and they didn't tell you that you had to do it 
which was beautiful about them. They would listen to anybody and their thoughts and have really good conversations. Even somebody who, you know, might not believe in a God at all. And I heard grandma many times having conversations where she was curious. She wanted to know why you thought this and why and it was, it was really, their faith was beautiful in that way because it wasn't, it didn't build walls between people. I think it's remarkable. I don't know anyone who's lost three children and the thought that they could still have such faith and still remain so positive and be so comforting to other people, mm -hmm. never putting their own grief on display, always smiling, always entertaining. It's actually astonishing, I think. Yeah, it is. And I think grandma was a little bit better at that than grandpa. Grandpa really had some heartbreak in this whole thing where he didn't understand how a God could let that happen to children, but he came through it. He just had lots and it's okay. I think God thinks it's okay for us to question. Uh, we wouldn't be human if we didn't question. So he had more questions than she did, but they both, you know, were very encouraging to each other. They both stayed their course and stayed, you know, going to their Bible studies and sharing with their Christian friends and things. And uh, they got through it. When you went away to college, your grandma sent you cassette tapes instead of letters. Did you keep them? <laughs> yes, that's in my garage, like I <laughs> talked about a few minutes ago. I need to find them, but I need to find them quickly and transfer them because I think the cassette tapes eventually, you know, go bad. But she used to just talk away and she would talk about what she was cooking and and I'd hear her mutter things to herself and then she'd get back on track and tell me something else about her day. They were lovely. I just enjoyed her tapes so much. It was like I was right there having a conversation with her. <laughs> I just love that. I don't know anyone else who had that experience. I think it's wonderful. Now, of course, Julie, no interview about Roy Rogers would be complete without asking you about your grandpa's famous horse, Trigger, who was absolutely a star in his own right. He was ridden by Olivia de Havilland in The Adventures of Robin Hood when his name was Golden Cloud before he became Trigger, right? Yes, that's right. That is that is right. Well, oh another thing that surprised me is that Trigger actually got top billing over Dale Evans in the movies. What did your grandma think of that? Okay, well, she was a little bit, you know, cheesed off about that. <laughs> and she would mention it a lot. I mean, she would joke about it, but she said she'd put her hands on her hips and say, I can't believe that I get billed after a horse. What is this all about? So she had enough humor around it that she actually wrote a song called Don't Ever Fall in Love with a Cowboy. And it goes on to say, because he'll love his horse the best. And I sang that song when my sisters and I were singing uh, around the country. And it's a very cute song. And it's just all about how she was third billing. And, you know, they would even get fan letters saying if he looked like he was even going to be close to kissing grandma, the little boys would write in and say, hey, hey, leave that mushy stuff out. We don't want that. So he was only allowed to kiss his horse. And grandma had issue with that too. Trigger even got his own fan mail. He got a lot of fan mail. So he was a pretty big deal. Well, I was a little boy in the early 60s and I certainly loved Trigger. And when you were just a toddler, you actually got to sit on Trigger. That must have been so exciting. It was. And I knew that I was safe. This horse was just amazing. It was like he knew that there was a small child on top of him because he didn't he he was like a rock. He didn't move. And I was able to sit there and stroke his mane and and my legs hardly reached over the top of the saddle. And I just wanted to ride him. But of course, at three years old, I'm not going to exactly ride him. That was just the beginning. But I, my memory of that is so vivid of my dad and grandpa taking me down to the stables on their property to uh, put me on top of Trigger. He could put all the grandkids on from mane to tail and Trigger would just stand there. He was such a great horse. Your grandpa used to take Trigger to children's hospitals to visit the children. How in the world did he get a horse into a hospital? <laughs> well, 
you know, he would put rubber shoes on trigger. He had about a hundred cues on him so that when you touched him in a certain place, he would know what cue that was. And one of those cues was to go to the bathroom. So he had, he cued him to go to the bathroom before he went in. So there weren't, there wasn't going to be any accidents and people all over the country knew trigger and they just were happy to have him come in. And the children loved having a horse come up to their bed. I mean, how many, how many kids can have that experience of being in a hospital bed and this huge horse's head come, you know, poking his nose over and, you know, they could feel his nose, even the little children who weren't able to see, they could feel his nose and feel his breath and his mane. And it was just a very, you know, grandpa would never leave without being teary eyed. He just, you know, both grandma and grandpa said nothing, nothing compares to seeing those kids faces, not any kind of public performance compares to that. I know your grandpa had Trigger mounted after he died in 1965, the way they preserve animals in museums. I understand that Trigger and Roy Rogers' dog, Bullet, are currently on exhibit at the John Wayne Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. Wasn't there any way to keep these animals in the family? We couldn't because the IRS came in and they appraised everything in the museum at exorbitant prices, which grandpa never paid that much for in the beginning, but the family owed half of that in tax taxes after they died. I guess it was called the death tax or whatever. So we had to sell everything in the museum. And uh, so we took it to Christie's auction house in New York City. And from that, we were able to pay the IRS off for all of these artifacts and things that they had in the museum. It was it was heartbreaking. It was hard and it was sad, but it, it's nice to know that so many people in the country loved grandma and grandpa so much that it meant a lot for them to have just a piece of their lives. And that really felt good for all of us in the family. And when you think about it, we have so many memories that you can't buy or sell of grandma and grandpa. And so I'm not losing out on anything. No, for sure. Well, we've talked about Trigger. I think it's only fair that we mention Dale Evans' horse, Buttermilk, who was rescued on its way to a slaughterhouse. Your grandma wasn't very fond of Buttermilk, was she? Not really. <laughs> he he had a little bit of a an attitude from being abused as a small horse. And that's no fault of his, of course, but he had to be worked with to get a little bit of a nicer disposition going on uh, for her to ride him. And he was a handful too. He was very much of a, he was a big horse and he had a big personality. So, and she wasn't a good rider. So she had a lot to handle it there at the very first, but he became better. She blames a lot of, you know, her, her caps on her fillings came off one time. He was a rough, rough ride. And so she, she was not a fan. She used to say, hey, don't taxidermy me and put me on top of buttermilk. You know, if you taxidermy buttermilk, don't don't do that to me. Was, uh, well, yeah, it, not sounds like, it sounds like buttermilk was quite feisty and sometimes a bit rough. Why didn't they get your grandmother a different horse that would be more gentle? Well, they did. She had a horse that was she really liked but it looked too much like Trigger. And back then they needed to have a horse that looked very different from Trigger, especially with the black and white movies and, and TV show that looked so different and that you could tell the difference. And I have not a lot of memories of Buttermilk. They didn't keep him at the ranch. They, I don't, I don't really know. They kept Trigger at the ranch, but not Buttermilk. Uh, but he was, he was very striking because he had that dark mane and that gray coat and it really showed up nicely next to Trigger. Well, I want to ask you now about the Roy Rogers and Dale Evans Museum. It first opened in 1967 in Apple Valley, California. Then it was moved to Victorville, California, where it ran for 27 years. And then after your grandparents passed away, the museum was moved to Branson, Missouri in 2003. And it closed for good in 2009. And as you mentioned, everything was auctioned off the next year. How did you feel about the museum being closed and the contents dispersed all over the world? I mean, that's, I know that it's an honor 
to think that so many people want a little piece of your grandparents, but it must have been tough on you and your fellow grandchildren and and your aunts and uncles. Yeah, because it felt like they were really gone. You know, before that, after they had passed, we still had the museum. We still had the memories that we could walk through and, and look at and reminisce because so much of what was in the museum was in their home when I was growing up in Chatsworth. And when all of that stuff was gone, even though it's just stuff, it was like the bottom dropped out and it was so final. I think that's, I think that's what was hardest about it. Like, and, and that was always a really good way for people to get in touch with me. I'd say, just call the museum and leave your phone number or whatever. And it was a good kind of a meeting point, so to speak. And that was just gone. So. Now, over the years, thanks to your connection to your grandparents, you've met a lot of big stars like Mickey Rooney, Dick Van Dyke, David Carradine, Clint Eastwood, Morgan Freeman, and even Hugh Hefner. And many celebrities have told you how much your grandparents meant to them and inspired them. That must be such a great feeling. You know, it's such a different feeling. I love it when fans come up. I'm not trying to uh, compare that. It's like apples and oranges because I love the stories that fans have, but there's something very special about their peers saying things about them that are meaningful and, and sweet memories about them. It just means a lot to know that even their peers loved them. And so many times I have run into people that are in that business. They, they have a story for me. Harry Morgan, who was on MASH, he had, his first movie was with Grandpa. He was so cute. He recalled every detail, you know, and I just I just love it. I love every story I hear. People say, oh, don't you get tired of the stories? No, I don't. I really don't. Even if they're the same, I don't get tired. Well, I think it makes sense to me because Roy Rogers and Dale Evans are irreplaceable. They've never been replaced. Yeah. That there's no one like them. Now, when I was doing my research for this interview, I read that there's a musical theater production called Happy Trails based on the lives of Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. Do you know anything about that? I don't know where the current situation stands, but it had the final, like the run through with the scripts on stage that my uncle Dusty went and saw and it made him tear up. It, he said it was so good. And, you know, those kinds of projects, you know, with COVID, it got kind of shelved for a while, like a lot of other things. And then when COVID opened up, they said, well, we can run it, but we'll have to have half the audience. And he didn't want to do that either because you, you don't want to start off like that. So we're just kind of hoping and praying that, that it still comes through. We just don't know a lot. My uncle is very smart. He doesn't just talk a lot about stuff. He kind of keeps it close until something happens. So I don't really know any more than that myself, but I know that it's gotten very far and there's the actual script and they've done the run through on it. Well, I have every faith that the show will eventually get produced and I'm sure it's going to be a huge hit because all of us baby boomers grew up watching your grandparents. I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about Roy Rogers and Dale Evans by going to their official website, RoyRogers.com. To learn more about the Happy Trails Children's Foundation, please go to HappyTrails.org. Well, Julie, I've only got one more question for you, and it's very important. Are you ready? I'm ready. What did your grandmother's pink and green taffy taste like? <laughs> oh, it was sugary. It was just something a kid loves. And the colors were bright. And I think that was half of why I liked it. I'd go for a green one, then I'd go for a pink one. And they were just fun to snitch off the buffet. And pretty soon she'd say, hey, there's a lot of them missing. And well, there you have it. Well, Julie, I've really enjoyed this chance to chat with you about your wonderful grandparents. Thank you for writing the book. 
and for making us all feel like we're part of your big family, because that's how I felt. And thank you so much for everything you do to perpetuate the legacy of Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. And of course, thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Well, I'm just really grateful that you had me on the show and it's been fun. I would do it again in a heartbeat and I'm very appreciative. Thank you for having me. Oh, it was our great pleasure. Our guest has been Julie Rogers Pomelia, author of Your Heroes, My Grandparents, A Granddaughter's Love, now available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my PR director, Lori Towers, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.